Hey everyone, Crisis here. As a lifelong fan of Batman and his extended family of other crime fighters, a conversation that's never too far out of sight is regarding which current or former protege of the Dark Knight is the most fit to assume Bruce Wayne's mantle if need be, whether he be deceased or indisposed. Now, there are many vigilantes who bear the markings of the Bat, in fact there's an entire corporation of them. However, this debate usually comes down to the inner circle of the Bat family, if you will. My goal here is to convey the stories and events themselves where the subject of the respective hero's assumption of the cape and cowl have been addressed directly, so suffice to say that if you don't see a hero mentioned in this video, there's not too much regarding their potential as Gotham's primary protector. This is a pretty contentious topic, many readers and fans all have their own picks, and I think that comes down to what one defines as Batman or even a hero. I asked my community directly what quality they think are most important to their perception of the vigilante, and the answers varied pretty wildly. That is to say that there's not really an objective truth here, because everyone has different ideas on either what Batman is or what he should be. This video will be my attempt to explain the fiction itself and infer, based on the stories, why certain candidates are either more or less suited to becoming Batman within the DC universe itself. I am going to try to take an objective look at the characters as they are, not as I or anyone else would want them to be, or think they necessarily are when the comics themselves treat the matter a certain way. As an example, whether you like it or not, Batman as he is now and has been for decades in the main continuity does not kill. I think matters like that should explain themselves as we go along but as well know that becoming or being Batman is not in any way necessarily an ascension for any of these characters. Every person here lays their life on the line for the greater good. I'm in no way saying that one hero is a better character or hero just because the comics depict them as a better candidate for the cape and cowl. You don't have to be Batman to stand among the greatest crime fighters in the DC universe. Also, I'm going to stick as close to the main continuity DC comic universe as possible, not so much any video game or cartoon adaptations, barring some alternate timelines when they're super relevant to addressing this question and have influenced the main universe in a big way. With that said, let's start with those portrayed to be among the least likely successors. Tim Drake, while being pretty consistently stated to be the best Robin, or the most complimentary sidekick to Bruce Wayne, at least, he both never wants to be Batman and is depicted as likely being a pretty perverse version of the Dark Knight. Early on, during the Tower of Babel storyline, Tim's team, Young Justice, questioned Drake on if he too had been studying and forming countermeasures against his own superpowered allies. This put strain on the young hero, caught between his mentor and his best friends. Tim doesn't want to think like Bruce, be like Bruce in that way. In his darkest moments, around the time both his best friend Connor Kent Superboy and Batman were considered deceased by most, the Red Robin found himself nearly as paranoid and isolated as the Dark Knight. However, this wasn't conveyed with a sense of natural growth or progression. Everyone around Tim, including Dick Grayson, tried to pull him out of this state. More to the point, throughout various arcs in post-Crisis Teen Titans and Rebirth Detective Comics, Tim would come face to face with a future version of himself which had been forced into becoming Batman. This version of Tim is considered to be very much linked to the main one. He's not just some random variant. In fact, we're shown that wounds inflicted upon the primary Tim Drake are then formed onto his future version, like the torture scene in Looper. Future Tim has gone back on all of his morals, his dreams and aspirations, and has become a gun-toting absolutist. With no other parties available to step up to the plate, he makes the move and begins systematically taking out each and every one of Gotham's rogues, even a renegade Damian Wayne. He lives a miserable and cold life, full well knowing how far he's fallen in what he believes to be a necessary crusade. When present Tim is confronted by this, he considers taking his own life if it means averting these results, and maintains forward that he will never be Batman beyond a shadow of a doubt. In short, he doesn't want to think like Bruce, 
and he never wants to be Batman, and the prospect of it ever happening is treated like a dark portent. I think an argument could be made that Tim is fundamentally very much like Bruce, but would rather make the conscious choice to be trusting and have those kinds of carefree relationships aside from any prepared countermeasures. His Red Robin comic, and as recently as that same Detective Comics Rebirth art, forced Tim to find a balance between those lifestyles with the possibility of his commitment towards that kind of distrust being conveyed as a slippery slope. Jason Todd, the second Robin, and the undisputed black sheep of the Bat family. As far as I've read, the two stories which offer the greatest insights into Jason's outlook on the mantle are the Battle for the Cowl and Urban Legends numbers 1 through 6 storylines. These arcs are about 12 years apart publication-wise and showcase Red Hood's development pretty profoundly. With Wayne presumed dead after the events of Final Crisis, as an extension of his Under the Red Hood motivations, Jason dons an armored bat suit and begins his blood-soaked assault on just about anyone he considers a problem. Many fans consider this an admirable quality. A lot of people want Batman to just end the Joker or Two-Face or any number of madmen who continually siege Gotham City. Narratively, however, this is portrayed as a bad thing and antithetical to the idea of Batman. I shouldn't have to explain that Jason is the villain of this story, or even just the threat that must be overcome, or that there are many videos and even comic issues explaining exactly why Batman doesn't kill, and anyone who does so in earnest are not up to assuming the role. Again, hyper-subjectivity and all, the subject of maybe even considering that Bruce Wayne's approach to being Batman can be improved upon in the eyes of many people. Is the standard what Wayne, the creator of the identity, thinks, or the readers asserting that he should do things differently? I'm going to go with Bruce for the sake of this analysis. Again, I'm focusing on the written word as it is. Batman does not kill. A Batman who kills is defined time and time again as a villain, so on and so on. In Urban Legends, however, Jason is forced to don an older model of Batsuit to use its cold-resistant tech against Mr. Freeze, certainly symbolically drawing a connection to Bruce and their respective hopes and fears. As an effect of a kind of reverse fear toxin, we learn that perhaps Bruce's deepest dream is silencing the Joker, finally bringing Jason back into the fold, as that very thing is what's been driving a wedge between the two since Todd's resurrection. Jason in turns dreams of abandoning his use of firearms, something instrumental in Wayne's foundational tragedy, and something that correlates Red Hood with any number of ne'er-do-well which every member of the Bat family hopes to vanquish. Both Jason and Bruce are desperate to compromise their convictions if it means the second Robin can fully return to the nest, to be fully welcomed by his family with open arms. While Bruce could never bring himself to destroy the Joker, which makes it that much more tragic that it's something at the very core of Wayne keeping Jason from being embraced, Jason does stop his use of guns by the end of issue 6, making the first move as far as restoring his place alongside his brothers and sisters. However, he continues to take life and ride the line of morality, and has come to blows with the Bat family and Batman again after these events. Regression, in my opinion, from a writer's perspective, but it certainly seems that Jason's likely to get in his own way when it comes to totally aligning with the methods and morals of Wayne and those like minds. He did meet an Earth-15 parallel counterpart, however, who was Batman and was stated to be among quote-unquote perfect versions of themselves on the DC website. So Jason has a lot of potential that he will likely never quite live up to in this regard. He has a very unique and tragic upbringing and wider past that distinguishes him from his peers, which makes him unique and interesting in his own right, but does not make him a valid Batman. These next two are honorable mentions, I guess. Tim Jace Fox is the son of Lucius Fox and the titular next Batman. While technically originating in Future State, Jace has appeared as Batman in the current continuity. Raven of the Teen Titans, with her precognitive abilities, stated that most of the events of Future State, point blank, will not happen, so I'm not going to so much look into those titles. However, regardless of that, 
Jace is a very insular hero at the moment. Stationed in New York rather than Gotham, Fox found the means to create a bat suit in an abandoned Wayne Tech bunker. He assumed the mantle of the next Batman, hoping to become a more tangible and apparent hero than what he called something in the distance and darkness. He has his own motives, distant from those of the typical Bat family, and has very few, if any, interactions with those crime fighters as of now. He's a very recent creation and is likely to step into the greater DC universe as the ongoing legacy-focused Dark Crisis event goes along. But for now, he seems very removed from the legacy of Bruce Wayne, which many consider to be essential when regarding this topic. Terry McGinnis, Batman Beyond, is both a protege of Bruce Wayne and the acting Dark Knight of Neo Gotham. While he originates from the iconic cartoon series, I'm going to defer to his DC Rebirth comic run as the context of that potential future much more matches that of the rest of today's contenders. Or in other words, the timeline of the DC animated universe differs greatly from the main comic one, and the relationships and interplay between characters are simply too different to compare. Grayson's relationship with Bruce is far more fractured in the animated series timeline compared to the main comics as an example. That being said, McGinnis, like Fox, has his own reasons for becoming Batman, apart from any Wayne baggage, unlike the other potential successors. Which again, it's a very subjective topic, could be a pro and a con for some. Terry saw the Batsuit as a means to an end, not only to avenge his father, but also to make up for his delinquent acts in his youth. Of course, he was trained by Bruce, but it's stated and shown that he'd do the job regardless of his input, and only later became ingrained into the larger Bat family fairly far into his career as Batman. McGinnis believes he is, and seems entirely capable of, maintaining a greater level of personal normalcy while at the same time being dedicated to protecting Gotham. Contrasting with Tim, who seems likely to naturally go too far and lose himself and his morals in that dedication. Currently in the Neo Year storyline, which is another timeline distinct from the Rebirth Batman Beyond comic run, this guy has like five different quote unquote main versions. Terry will have to learn how to define his identity as Batman without Wayne there to back him up. But before even that, and with his dying words, Bruce believed in Terry and viewed him as the caped crusader, and now asks him to go beyond. Both Fox and Terry exercise different ideals than Wayne, which asks the question of how valid of successors they really are in the main canon. Batman Beyond is of course just any number of possible futures, but I'd surely get at least a few comments if I failed to mention these two, as they both are essentially called the next Batman. It again comes down to what you think succeeding Bruce Wayne looks like, changing the role for debatably the better, or embodying what Bruce defined it to be to the utmost. These next three I consider to be the top contenders, by both the fiction and the fan base. Damian Wayne is the only biological child of the mainline Bruce Wayne, which leads him and many readers to believe he is the only true heir to Batman. A detraction to that is, however, the existence of the Batman in Bethlehem version of future Damian, heavily featured in Grant Morrison's Bat books, as well as that prior mentioned Titans Tomorrow storyline. Even as recently as 2021 in Urban Legends number 7, we return to this world where Bruce Bruce Wayne's retired, Grayson as Batman was killed in action, and a pretty unhinged Damien commits a murder spree, resulting in more or less the biblical apocalypse. Grant Morrison, ladies and gentlemen. This dark fate even influenced the decision-making process of the main Bruce Wayne in Morrison's New 52 Batman and Robin. So again, not just some one-off possible future. It actually has stakes in the main timeline. In 2020, after the death of Alfred and the near death of Nightwing, Damien fell back onto his cutthroat assassin instincts, going as far as secretly torturing Deathstroke under the Teen Titans' noses. The resulting fallout of these actions caused the father and son duo to clash, leading Damien to abandon his father's side and the role of Robin. This leads into Joshua Williams' Robin run, which concludes with the boy Wonder in a kind of Nightwing-type era of self-discovery which should lead into the upcoming Batman vs. Robin arc, which promises to assess Damien's drive to eventually succeed his father. Safe to say, Damien has a lot of room to grow and needs to showcase his potential maturity. 
because, if left as is, the grandson of the demon could very well become a killer unto future Tim and lead to the actual end of the earth. These last two are, in my opinion, both the most likely and most considered when talking about the heir to the bat. His first son, and arguably the closest he's ever had to a daughter, that being Dick Grayson and Cassandra Kane. The first Robin, unlike anyone else mentioned in this video, is the only other hero to be a fully sanctioned and bona fide replacement for Bruce Wayne multiple times in the main continuity. It's an easy fit. Someone who's known Bruce the longest, has the most experience with and apart from Bruce, and has all the qualities becoming of his own Dark Knight. Wayne chose Asriel to take up the job in the 90s because he rightfully figured that Nightwing wouldn't want to, and he just wanted to respect that decision. He then later on stated that Dick was the right choice all along. After Final Crisis, Dick willingly became Batman in Bruce's absence after realizing that, among the expansive Bat family, that he was the only one capable of doing it and doing it right, and Gotham needed a Batman. Even when Bruce came back to life, he entrusted Grayson with the protection of Gotham while he chartered the globe setting up Batman Incorporated. In the New 52 and Rebirth, we learn that Dick and Bruce both have a reciprocated spoken agreement that Grayson will always be there to beat the Batman if Bruce ever cannot. So for those thinking that Bruce is the only person capable of doing the job, Bruce disagrees. This position, however, has its detractors, but they're coming from a place of empathy. In both Nightfall and Morrison's Batman and Robin era, Dick was marred by self-doubt, imposter syndrome, and longing for Bruce while donning the mantle, at least at this time. He had to work to make the role as much as his own as he could, something Bruce admires in fact, stating he wore the cowl well. Even Superman agrees and calls Dick Batman. I think more recent stories have sidestepped any of Grayson's potential dread, however, whether it be convincing even the Joker that he's Bruce Wayne's Batman, standing in for Bruce while he attends jury duty, and in pretty much every one of the alternate, but very much linked to the main timeline possible futures already mentioned. However, a common theme to Nightwing's character, which is demonstrated by Future Tim's account of his timeline, Dick can't help but change. Whereas Batman is something that needs to be eternal, Grayson's filled so many roles that being the Dark Knight night after night in Gotham is pretty much the polar opposite of him as a person and as he's been written throughout the decades. We will probably never see Bruce grow old in the main timeline, but every time that story's been told in others, he does the job until he's gray in pretty much every one of them. It's a strength of Nightwing that he's been allowed to change and grow, whereas the status quo of the Batman comics have kind of pigeonholed writers into characterizing Bruce as a sort of statuesque, non-changing, more or less developmentally stunted guy who is and has to be Batman because that's who he is at the end of the day. I love Batman, but every comic character as big as he is always finds a way back to familiar territory eventually. All that is to say, despite having been Batman, pretty much accepted him being Batman in the future, having Bruce's respect and blessing, Dick won't make it his life and would likely never do it forever. Which brings us to the second Batgirl, Cassandra Cain, who is a cult favorite among Bat Family fans and has a lot going for her in this regard. She has a powerful connection and respect for the symbol of the bat, considering it even more important than the actual man, Bruce Wayne. She stated that at times, all she's ever wanted to do was eventually succeed Bruce Wayne as the primary protector of Gotham. Her fighting skills are certainly beyond par, as even Bruce admits he'd straight up lose to her in a fight, and he's even verbalized her potential role as his replacement before in the early 2000s. However, it seems like editorial at DC has done a number on her, which affects the narrative no matter how you look at it. Both times when Bruce was presumed dead in the past, Cass either attempted to assemble a squad boasting skills representative of Batman as an attempt to replace him, or was part of a secret pact to give up her role as Batgirl so Stephanie Brown would come into her own. And of course, Battle for the Cowl, which Cass was present for, features Dick taking up the mantle. Her seeking out of members of a team to compensate for the loss of Bruce also plays into Wayne's thoughts surrounding Cass as he places her beside Tim Drake's Robin, implying that while her combat abilities were remarkable, 
her deduction needed some bolstering. In my opinion, Batman literally works best with a Robin around, both in the universe and as terms as, you know, the enjoyment as the reader. So this fact influencing her potential as an heir depends on if you think Batman should be able to operate well enough alone. And that's the operative word here, I think. Potential. Out of anyone here, I think Cassandra fits the bill of an effective long-term replacement for Bruce more than anyone else. He and Barbara Gordon admit that she's most reminiscent of Wayne, and he's entrusted her enough to be on the inside of his secret plans more than once. But at the same time, whether you agree with the writing decisions or not, every time Bruce's position has opened up, Cass never acted out that potential or has been sidelined entirely, either willingly or because of DC. I think the new 52 has a lot to do with it, taking a lot of the wind from her sails. She was pretty much an entirely new character who needed to build all new relationships in the reboot. She didn't even become Batgirl again until 2020. That's five years from her new introduction until she even resembled at least her character design from post-crisis. I wonder with Dark Crisis happening, and Bruce being off the board as it were, if we'll see someone fill that vacuum in Gotham. I kind of doubt it given the comics we know are coming out. They'll probably just ignore Gotham until he's back, but I don't think there's been a narrative push to take Bruce out of the city or see how any other Bat family member would perform in the role since Jim Gordon did it, which is going to be the last time I mention his Batman. So what does it all come down to? Tim, Jason, and Damien all have a dark shadow hanging over their potential as Batman, mixed in with them mostly not even wanting the role. Terry's not necessarily canon, but personally, I think someone like him would be best suited if you think a random person could eventually prove themselves as Batman. I don't even have to keep epilogue a secret because as far as we know, that episode is not canon to any of the main Batman Beyond comics. Jace is pretty much totally estranged from Bruce and doesn't fit the term successor, so that leaves Dick and Cassandra. As far as what's on the page, again, Dick is literally the guy to take up for Bruce if need be, and he seems more comfortable with that responsibility when compared to the past. He has all the skills to do it, with the Cape Crusader even calling Nightwing a clearer version of what Batman should be. But again, that kind of plays into the point. Dick is better as Nightwing than he would be as Batman, and even Bruce agrees he might just be better than Batman anyway. We know that being Batman is not his destiny, so in the long term, I'd say Cassandra is the best bet, but she has some work to do before she gets there. She seems either unconfident at times, and her harsh upbringing may hinder her detective abilities a bit. She was pretty much foundationally trained for just combat when being Batman requires many additional skills. Not that fighting is her only strength, Batman himself considers her needing Tim's detective skills, so she could improve upon that facet of crime fighting as an example. All in all, I think I've done a good job of conveying the answer as far as the comics tell us in regards to the respective protege's relationship with the mantle of Dark Knight. It really is up to you depending on many personal opinions. Should Batman kill? Is being a fighter more than a detective good enough? Should we really care if anyone wants to be Batman, if they're best for the job? How much should the legend of Batman influence their motives? Many questions pertaining to the core of heroism and morality, so your mileage may vary. But with all that said, I hope you're satisfied with my analysis. Let me know in the comments who you think would be the best to take over for Bruce. And as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.